Good afternoon, guys, and, and thank you for coming. Uh, we're very honored this afternoon to have the second speaker in uh, our series of commemorating Brown versus Board of Education and the Civil Rights Act movement of 1964. It's hosted by, uh, excuse me, sponsored by the Law School, the Black Law Students Association, and the American uh, Constitutional Law Society. I'll say a couple words about Professor Lovelace. Professor Lovelace uh, received his PhD and JD from the University of Virginia. Uh, before joining the faculty, Professor Lovelace served as the Assistant Director of the Center for the Study of Race and Law at the University of Virginia School of Law. I'd like to introduce to some and present to others Professor Timothy Lovelace. Thanks so much, Cedric, for the warm introduction. Uh, thanks to the law school, ACS, and BALSA for putting on this talk. Um, today in my talk, Freedom Dreams, I'll primarily talk about how Dr. King appropriated Brown I, right, from 1954 through 1958. And for shorthand purposes, I'll simply refer to Brown I as Brown. In those cases where I'm referring to Brown II or Cooper, I'll refer to them by name, Brown II or Cooper. So while outside of the legal academy, many, of, many people on the left and the right have embraced Brown. They use Brown for their own ideological goals, their own political goals. Many inside the legal academy have been far more skeptical of Brown's significance. To be sure, the skeptics of Brown would concede a couple of things. First, they concede that Brown expressed an important anti-discrimination perspective. They would also concede that the court's unanimous opinion is particularly important in spite of a legislative history right, that shows that the ratifiers of the 14th Amendment were not thinking about school desegregation. Others would note, for better or worse, that Brown propelled the usage of sociological evidence in civil rights jurisprudence. And finally, these skeptics would note that Brown, for better or worse, again, symbolized and continues to symbolize the promise of racial equality and a nation that holds itself out to be exceptional. For many of these legal scholars, across the ideological spectrum, Brown was a failure. They've argued that Brown did not immediately desegregate schools in the Confederacy in the wake of the 54 decision, that the Dahl test itself was junk science, that the NAACP's litigation strategy took away from a focus on economic issues, and move the NAACP's focus to something perhaps more trivial, school desegregation, that Brown didn't recognize the dual harms of racial segregation, that Brown implied that all black settings were inferior, right, and all white settings were superior, right? that many black communities did not want school desegregation. And finally, many writers today, many skeptics of Brown writing 60 years after the court's opinion. They see racial resegregation in schools. They see the current racial problems in America. And so they write against Brown out of frustration for the contemporary situation. You know these arguments. This has become the civil rights canon in the legal academy, right? These arguments are rehearsed in constitutional law classes, in educational law classes, and even in race and law classes across the nation. To be sure, some of these arguments, and I stress some of these arguments, may perhaps have some merit. But given the sheer numbers, the sheer numbers of legal histories calling Brown a failure, we are forced to ask, what good, if any, was the Brown decision for African-American activists living in the South in the wake of the Supreme Court's 54 decision. So today, I'll, I'll answer this question by turning in part to Dr. King, one of, obviously, the nation's greatest patriots and drum majors for justice. Well, why Dr. King? I didn't pick Dr. King because I want to advance a King-centric narrative in the civil rights movement that only holds that the that the only valuable view on the civil rights movement is Dr. King's. I don't want to advance 
the idea that there was not a diversity of perspectives within the civil rights movement in the mid to late 1950s. To be sure, Dr. King is not black America's messiah. It's critical to avoid the hagiography that's dominated the scholarship on King. Dr. King was not a social movement, but rather he was one person in a social movement. However, I've chosen King easily, the movement's most recognizable face for a couple of reasons. Despite the feverish pace of many of these scholarly debates on Brown, surprisingly, there's a dearth of credible, deeply researched legal histories on King's early views of Brown. And because in the few instances where Dr. King gets some sustained treatment by people like Gerald Rosenberg, a University of Chicago law professor, and Michael Klarman, a Harvard law school professor, when they've interrogated Dr. King's early views on Brown, they've profoundly misunderstood and mischaracterized those views. In numerous law review articles and in his book, Hollow Hope, Gerald Rosenberg argues, quote, there is little to no evidence that supports the claim that Brown gave civil rights salience, pressed political elites to act, pricked the conscience of whites, legitimated the grievances of blacks, or inspired the activists, activists of the civil rights movement. It is not entirely clear that knowledge of Brown was widespread. Overall, the, the reaction within the black community to Brown was muted. Rosenberg continues to treat Dr. King as someone uninterested in constitutional law, maintaining King rooted his beliefs in Christian theology and Gandhian nonviolence, not constitutional doctrine. Michael Corman's work, while praised widely by both legal scholars and historians, his work also misses the significance of Brown to activists like Dr. King. For example, in Michael Klarman's Bancroft award-winning work, right, the Bancroft is the top history prize. In this Bancroft award-winning book from Jim Crow to Civil Rights, Klarman declares that the Montgomery bus boycott of 1955 and 56 had, quote, very little connection to the Brown decision. For Klarman, Brown is a failure because it did not directly produce a mass social movement that inspired both constitutional and social change. But that the views of Dr. King are so misunderstood and mischaracterized, this should be shocking to us in the legal academy. That the omission in the law reviews of someone so important has been missed should signal to us if we miss Dr. King, how much more have we missed in the civil rights scholarship? Part of this problem, I argue, is a methodological problem. That the legal literature on Brown versus Board of Education has been dominated by what Brown versus Board of Education should have said, rather than how did activists living on the ground experience Brown? Moreover, many of the legal scholars who write on Brown, like Rosenberg and Klarman, author historical articles on the movement not from the perspectives of the activists themselves. In other words, they're writing movement histories without movement activists actually speaking. If you read Klarman's footnotes, if you read Rosenberg's footnotes, they're dominated by, quote, traditional sources. Right? And what books about Dr. King have said about Dr. King. They don't engage in the intellectual heavy lifting of going to civil rights archives, of reading black newspapers, or being in conversation with activists themselves. We have a generation of scholarship that mutes the voices of those the scholarship purports to represent. Today, I intervene in this conversation by placing Dr. King in the context of Black Montgomery and taking Dr. King and his allies on their own terms. I quote extensively, I will quote extensively today from Dr. King, from his writings, from his personal papers, and his speeches. Accordingly, I'll weave together three different analytic threads. First, I demonstrate that Dr. King, like other black activists in Montgomery, found the 54 decision 
clearly inspirational. As Rosenberg's scholarship in particular vividly illustrates, far too many of these scholars have missed Brown's inspirational impact. Second, I'll demonstrate that King's regular invocation of Brown was not simply inspirational, it was also instrumental. Carmen and Rosenberg have missed the significance of Brown because they don't understand how social movements work. They're focused on these direct causal chains, examining whether Brown caused mass action, right, seeking constitutional and legal change. They've also argued that Brown emboldened segregationists who refused to comply with the Supreme Court's mandate and didn't desegregate schools. But today I provide you a different perspective on Brown. I place Brown in a larger international context. Brown was significant, I'll show, because it gave black activists like Dr. King a new language to negotiate the demands of civil rights leadership during the Cold War. In other words, the court's reasoning in Brown quickly transformed into a tool for black activists' social movement repertoire. Because at a junction in the Cold War where McCarthyism had, event, uh, had destroyed national civil rights leadership, the nation was also ostensibly interested in projecting a positive image of American democracy abroad. Brown gave non-lawyers like Dr. King a new legal vocabulary to defend their struggle as both constitutional and quintessentially American. I also maintain that Brown was not simply a shield that Dr. King and others used to defend blacks against charges that the movement was subversive. It was also a sword. To be sure, black activists in Montgomery didn't need non-white men from Washington to tell them that racial segregation was wrong. But King and others used the logic of Brown, again, as a tool to criticize segregationists for maintaining Jim Crow in schools, as well as Jim Crow in a host of other public spaces, spaces like public transportation and the ballot box. King strategically used the Cold War decision as a legal yardstick to measure whites' commitments to US constitutional values precisely at a time when many Americans believed that US constitutional values were under attack by subversives and by outsiders. Brown expanded the civil rights lexicon, and King seized upon this language in the decision to ask new legal questions about segregation. Towards this end, King highlighted the psychological impact of racial segregation. He asked whites who wanted to spread the rule of law abroad how committed were they to the rule of law at home? King challenged federal officials and segregationists alike to respect the institutional legitimacy of the Supreme Court, and more broadly, the concept of federal supremacy. And he used the Supreme Court's very broad ruling of the 14th Amendment to validate other very broad readings of the state action doctrine. Simply put, Brown was not a perfect weapon to fight for civil rights during the Cold War. But Brown was important because at a time, on one hand, when federal officials were increasingly interested in projecting a positive image of American democracy abroad, but also worried about subversion in the civil rights movement. And on the other hand, black leaders and communities were committed to racial insurgency, but also concerned with being rendered as un-American. Brown gave leaders like Dr. King a way to simultaneously demonstrate his fidelity to both his race and his nation. Lastly, before I begin uh, telling you the stories about Dr. King, I want to give you a couple of caveats. In my talk today, I won't discuss whether Brown versus Board of Education is a success or a failure. This is part of, in many ways, the problem, this contemporary perspective. It's also well-trodden territory. Second, I'm not going to discuss whether Dr. King's views of Brown were either right or wrong. Again, it's important to take historical actors on their own terms and, uh, and avoid presentists and ahistorical approaches to understanding civil rights activism 
in the wake of the, in the, wake of the Brown decision. Finally, I won't discuss the broader question of whether courts can ever produce significant social change. I'm only going to interrogate Dr. King's understanding of the relationship between courts and society and avoid transhistorical discussions of the role of courts in social change over many different times and many different spaces. In essence, I want to return to legal history by giving a deeply historicized lecture on how Dr. King, like many activists in Montgomery, experienced and appropriated the Brown decision in the years from 54 to 58. So when Dr. King, when, when the Brown decision comes down, Dr. King's in graduate school. He's finishing his dissertation, and he would graduate in the summer of 1954. He's 25 years old. He had only been married to Coretta Scott for 11 months. He hasn't even moved to Montgomery yet. He's left us no writings on the Brown decision itself from May 1954. But we can get a view of Dr. King's perspective on Brown by talking, by being in conversation with Ralph Abernathy, the minister from Montgomery who becomes Dr. King's best friend. In 1954, while still a graduate student, Dr. King had become pastor-elect of the Dexter Avenue Baptist Church. And Dr. King takes over at Dexter Avenue for Vernon Johns, the uncle of Barbara Johns. You remember the story of Barbara Johns, right? Barbara Johns is the 15-year-old student who leads the student strike in Prince Edward County, Virginia, right? leading to the case, Prince Edward County, uh, Davis v. Prince Edward County. Davis, right, as you know, is one of the five Brown cases. And so Vernon Johns is obviously closely watching his family in Prince Edward County. In fact, he's traveling back and forth from Montgomery to Virginia. And when Dr. King is about to give his trial sermon in Montgomery, he meets with Vernon Johns and Ralph Abernathy to have dinner. And at this dinner, Ralph Abernathy has said, we all agreed that Brown versus Board of Education altered forever the conditions on which the continuing struggle would be predicated. No longer was the law unambiguously on the side of Jim Crow. It now appeared as if the law was on our side, that the federal government might eventually be pressed into service in our freedom fight. But we don't even have to go to Ralph Abernathy. We can see Dr. King in his own voice. In a speech called Desegregation and the Future, Dr. King explicitly endorses both the language and the logic of the Brown decision. Moreover, during this 1956 speech, an event that obviously Klarman and Rosenberg are unaware of, King connects many of the participants with the Brown decision with himself. He's introduced at this talk by Kenneth Clark, the psychologist who authors the Dahl study right. that becomes footnote 11 in the Brown case. He's on the program with Bill Fleming, a leader in the Clarendon County movement, the rural hamlet that inspired the Briggs v. Elliott decision, one of, the, one of the five Brown cases. And the 1956 program in which Dr. King speaks is dedicated to Judge Waits Waring, the federal judge in South Carolina that rules in the Brown decision. And he writes, separate is inherently unequal. During desegregation in the future, Dr. King proclaims, quote, on May 17, 1954, the Supreme Court of this nation rendered in simple and unequivocal terms one of the most momentous decisions ever rendered in the history of this nation. To all men of goodwill, this decision came as a joyous daybreak to, to end the long night of human captivity it came as a great beacon of light, of hope to millions of colored people throughout the world who had a dim vision of the promised land of freedom and justice. It was a reaffirmation of the good old American doctrine of freedom and equality for all men. And this decision came as a legal and sociological death blow to an evil that had occupied the throne of American life for several decades. It's a message that King often presents during the Montgomery bus boycott year of 1956. He gives this speech in New York. He gives this speech in Chicago. He gives this speech again in Montgomery. Furthermore, in desegregation in the future, King is obviously employing Brown to navigate US Cold War politics. 
He says that there's an urgent need, quote, to support the organization which has mastered the area of legal strategy, which is the NAACP, by fighting its battles purely within the framework of legal democracy, King underscored. Quote, it has saved the Negro from turning to foreign ideologies in order to solve its problems. In this 1956 speech, King, who had been an executive member of the Montgomery chapter of the NAACP, used the language of Brown, and more broadly, the NAACP's approach to school desegregation to highlight why, why the Plessy Doctrine was wrong. Segregation was wrong for Dr. King in this speech because the idea of separate was always in force, but the idea of equality was never in force. King also declared that even if it were possible to equalize facilities, blacks still faced not only a quantitative hurdle to overcome, but also a qualitative hurdle to overcome. King writes, quote, if it had been possible to give Negro children the same number of schools proportionally and the same type of buildings as white children, the Negro children would have co still confronted equality in the sense that they would not have had the opportunity of communicating with all other children. King then moved on. And unlike the Supreme Court's decision, but like Kenneth Clark's Dahl study, and like the NAACP's brief in Brown, he then recognized the dual harm of racial segregation. He said that segregation creates, quote, a false sense of inferiority in the segregated, and it gives the segregated a false sense of superiority. It's equally damaging. And this is why we must take a stand against segregation, King writes, because it does something to the soul. King would then, King would then uh, give us a theme that we would see in the letter from the Birmingham jail. He says that segregation gives us an I-it relationship instead of an I-thou relationship, relegating people to the status of things. In Montgomery, we also see Dr. King using the Brown, using the Brown uh, decision, not simply in stump speeches. Contrary to Rosenberg's work, Brown found resonance with many of Dr. King's allies in Montgomery. Rosa Parks wrote, you can't imagine the rejoicing among black people and some white people when the Supreme Court decision came down in May 1954. It was a hopeful time. African Americans believed that at last there was a real chance to change the segregation laws. Although Rosa Parks didn't wait to hear arguments for Brown too, she went about her business. She then packed up in her car and headed to the halfway house of the civil rights movement, the, the Highlander Folk School. She attended a workshop there in, entitled, quote, Racial Desegregation Implementing the Supreme Court Decision. At this workshop, there was another Montgomery resident, Edie Nixon. Edie Nixon was the president of the Montgomery chapter of the NAACP, a close friend of A. Philip Randolph and a mentor of Dr. King's. Under Nixon, in September 1954, Montgomery petitioned the Montgomery, the Montgomery NAACP petitioned the Montgomery School Board to desegregate public schools. And on the first day of schools, in the September 1954 school year, 23 black school children left their segregated school in Montgomery and marched two blocks to a newly created white school attempting to desegregate. Brown mattered in Montgomery, Alabama. The historical record also shows how Carmen and Rosenberg overlook how black activists like Dr. King looked to the Supreme Court as an institution to validate its struggle against racial equality and render blacks fully human and not as subversives. On the eve of the Montgomery bus boycott, Dr. King gives this famous speech. He says, if we are wrong, then the Supreme Court is wrong. If we are wrong, this, the Constitution is wrong. If we are wrong, then God Almighty is wrong. If we are wrong, then Jesus was merely a utopian dreamer that never came down to earth. This isn't a black Baptist church. The Supreme Court better be right. But it's important to note that as King is linking the Montgomery bus boycott to the institutional legitimacy of the court and highlighted the need to act in accordance with the court's ruling, he carefully placed his dissent within the confines of the Cold War. King in his same speech says, and certainly this is the glory of America with all of its faults, 
This is the glory of our democracy. If we were incarcerated behind the iron curtains of a communistic nation, we couldn't do this. If we were dropped into the dungeon of a totalitarian regime, we couldn't do this. King then added that black Montgomerians were not like white mobs who, quote, stand up and defy the constitution of this nation. In the wake of the Gale v. Browder decision, King then again linked the Montgomery bus boycott to Brown. In a 56 speech, again at the Holt Street Baptist Church, King says this decision, Gale, was a reaffirmation of the principle that separate facilities are inherently unequal and that the old Plessy doctrine of separate but equal is no longer valid, either sociologically or legally. King would then paraphrase his words from desegregation in the future. This decision came to us as a joyous daybreak to end the long night of enforced segregation in public transportation. And if you simply read the opinions in Browder v. Gale, the lower court opinion, and then Gale v. Browder, the Supreme Court opinion, both courts are siding directly to Brown. On the second anniversary of Brown, King had become a national and even, that, uh, even international figure. King has people from as far as India coming to Montgomery to study nonviolence. And during this period, King would give lots of speeches across the country. One of the speeches that he gives in 56, he renders the Brown decision, again, as quintessentially American, Christian, right? and as a way to advance the US's struggle for the hearts and minds of the third world. King wrote in this speech, but one day, through a world-shaking decree by nine justices of the Supreme Court of America, the Red Sea was open, and the forces of and the forces of justice were able to pass through to the other side. Negroes, like exploited masses across the world, are winning freedom from the Egypt of colonialism and are now able to move towards the promised land of economic security and cultural development. In 56, Dr. King takes this Cold War civil rights framework and the story of Brown and massive resistance to the Democratic National Convention. In his speech, he says, many tragic occurrences have taken place in the South in recent months to place in jeopardy the basic rights guaranteed every citizen in the Constitution. Elements in the South have risen up in open defiance. The legislative halls of the South ring loud with such words as nullification and interposition. Methods of defiance range from economic reprisals of the Deep South to the tragic reign of bombings, beatings, and mob rule. Many noble citizens are losing their jobs because they stand in accordance with the decisions of the Supreme Court on desegregation. King would then make a bolder stance than he had pre previously done before to white audiences, pressing the Truman administration to not simply see civil rights as a foreign policy issue, but also as a moral issue. King wrote, it is true that a firm stance for civil rights would tremendously increase our prestige in international affairs and eliminate a convenient tool in the hands of communistic propaganda. But the motive for making justice a reality in America must not, be, must, must not merely be to, to compete with totalitarian powers. It must be done not merely because it's diplomatically expedient, but because it's morally compelling. King would then press for two uh, planks on the Democratic uh, ticket that were related to school desegregation. First, he wanted a plank where the federal government would, quote, take the necessary executive and legislative action to implement the school desegregation decisions of the Supreme Court. And second, he proposes the Powell Amendment, right? the provision that prohibits the federal government from using federal funds to discriminate on the basis of rates. Right? Rosenberg gives lots of credit to the Powell Amendment as being Right? The impetus to desegregate public schools. It's the same formula used in Title VI. But clearly, Rosenberg, not in conversation with the Civil Rights Archives, is unaware that Dr. King himself endorses the Powell Amendment. In 1957, King and other non-lawyers again leveraged the Supreme Court's institutional legitimacy to advance civil rights during the Cold War. In March of 57, the Gold Coast becomes Ghana. This is the first sub-Saharan African country to get independence from a prior European ruler. 
Dr. King is there with people like Horace Mann Bond, Julian Bond's father, who helps to author part of the brief in Brown, with people like Adam Clayton Powell. Also in attendance is Richard Nixon. Archival research demonstrates that Richard Nixon was there because he was concerned that Nkrumah would fall into the Soviet sphere of influence. Dr. King had been telegramming both Richard Nixon and President Eisenhower to meet with them to push for a Civil Rights Act of 1957. And when Dr. C Dr. King sees Richard Nixon at a cocktail party in Ghana, he corners Richard Nixon. Nixon and federal officials, federal, uh, the Federal Archives show, was that Nixon was worried about whether activists like King would use the Ghana independence celebration to tarnish the image of American democracy abroad. King, as he relayed to other officials, and in the Federal Archives show, knew that he had an international audience. And he again asked Richard Nixon for a meeting at the White House to talk about the Civil Rights Act of 1957. Nixon, concerned with the Cold War implications of Dr. King's presence in Ghana, agreed to meet with Dr. King in the summer of 1957. It took 8,000 miles to get this meeting. Dr. King, though, meets with Richard Nixon. On May 1957, the third anniversary of Brown, beginning at the exact hour in which Chief Justice Warren read the Supreme Court's decision in Brown, the SCLC, the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, has its first major event, the prayer pilgrimage. I'll show you an image of the prayer pilgrimage. If you didn't know better, you would think that this is the March on Washington. And in many ways, this is a dress rehearsal for the March on Washington. You see the flag, right? You see Dr. King in a preacher's robe. And the idea of a prayer pilgrimage is linking right, these American values, these Christian values, and then the civil rights movement. This screams, we are American. We're not communists. Again, attendees here are people like Adam Clayton Powell and members of the Little Rock Nine. At this speech, Dr. King gives, at this, um, at this march, Dr. King gives a speech called Give Us the Ballot, in which he links voting, a cornerstone of American democracy, to the Brown decision. Give us a ballot, Dr. King writes, and we will fill our legislative halls with men of goodwill and send to the sacred halls of Congress men who will not sign a Southern manifesto because of their devotion to the manifesto, the manifesto of justice. Give us the ballot and we will quietly and nonviolently, without rancor or bitterness, implement the Supreme Court's decision of May 17, 1954. King added that the movement to secure the ballot was part of a larger movement where blacks found common cause with other racially oppressed people across the world. We proudly proclaim that three-fourths of the people of this world are colored, King said. We have the privilege of noticing in our generation the great drama of freedom and independence as it unfolds in Asia and Africa. All of these things are in line with the unfolding work of Providence. King would repeat this on May 17, 1958, and again on May 17, 1959. And then Little Rock. King would watch Elizabeth Eckford mobbed by whites in the streets. He would watch members of the black press beaten savagely by white mobs. He would watch a school zone turn into reconstruction. And so in 57, in September 57, Dr. King telegrams Daisy Bates, the leader of the Little Rock Nine. In the telegram, he writes, you have no alternative but to continue the struggle for integrated schools. I know that this is the uh, difficult advice at a time in which you're being terrorized, stoned, and threatened by ruthless mobs. But world opinion is on your side. Keep struggling with this fate and the tragic midnight of anarchy and mob rule which encompasses your city at this time will be transformed into the glowing daylight of freedom and justice. Dr. King even put himself in harm's way. During the 57-58 school year, he makes two trips and gives speeches in Little Rock. When Ernest Green becomes the first African-American to graduate from Little Rock Central High School, Dr. King is there. 
with Ernest Green. And when Little Rock decides to close its schools during the 58-59 school year, citing compliance with Brown, Dr. King expressed frustration with Brown too. The court's idea, he said, was that the gradual approach would be more effective and more conducive to social stability than immediate or forthwith desegregation. Recent incidents of violence should cause us to question the gradual approach to desegregation in public schools. There is evidence that a forthright approach to the problem is less likely to result in intense or prolonged violent resistance. Dr. King here is again lifting from his friend Kenneth Clark. Kenneth Clark had, Kenneth Clark had authored a study that you see in the Brown Briefs that immediate desegregation had a better psychological impact on the recipients of desegregation than gradual desegregation. Dr. King would write, the slower the process, the more time the opposition has to organize, mobilize, and intensify its opposition. We see that there is just as much violence as if the process had taken, had taken place immediately. Dr. King then pushed a line of reasoning that was in the NAACP's briefs in Cooper and a, and a line of logic that was pushed by the, the full Supreme Court, including Justice Frankfurter, who concurred in the opinion. Dr. King wrote, state and local office holders of high and low station and national legislatures, all sworn to uphold the Constitution, have incited disobedience of the law and have campaigned nationally for support for their position. It is no secret that the foreign relations program of our nation has been hampered and damaged by the discriminatory treatment accorded to citizens of the United States solely on the basis of their race and color. In our worldwide struggle to strengthen the free world against the spread of totalitarianism, we are sabotaged by the totalitarian practices forced upon millions of our Negro citizens. So in conclusion, Brown was clearly inspirational to civil rights activists, contrary to Gerald Rosenberg's argument, and offered non-lawyers new language to advance civil rights activism during the chill of the Cold War while remaining politically viable, unlike people like Du Bois, Paul Robeson, and William Patterson. Moreover, when Dr. King began to insert himself in these school desegregation battles, his rhetoric even begins to change. King, this extremist for love and freedom, concluded his call for school desegregation and desegregation and, and freedom with a refrain that is familiar to many of our ears. Freedom must ring from every mountaintop, and yes, let it ring from the snow-capped mountains of the Rockies and the prodigious hills of New Hampshire. Let it ring from the mighty Alleghenies of Pennsylvania and the curvaceous slopes of California. Let it ring from every molehill in Mississippi, from every mountain, mountain and hill in Alabama, from Stone, Mountain, Georgia in, from Stone Mountain in Georgia, and from Lookout Mountain in Tennessee. Let freedom ring. And when that happens, the morning stars will sing together, and the sons of God will shout for joy. Thank you. We'll now open it up for questions and answers. So Dr. King is not an individual who is either unknown or whose writings are widely unavailable. Why the absence? Uh, in Carmen's work and uh, Rosenberg's work. Um, I really appreciated your focus on the history uh, of this. Um, I remember talking to a very well-known black political scientist, Hayes Walton, about Gerald Rosenberg's work. And he, um, he said, when I told him about Rosenberg's thesis, he said, that's ridiculous. Of course not. Um, I was there, and I saw what happened in 1954 in these small towns in Virginia and Georgia and all sorts of places like that. And the massive resistance alone was 
an indication that this had, um, that this was um, important on the ground. So, so why the absence? Part of it is about sources, right? So, if you're not in civil rights archives, then you don't have the voices of these activists to use. Um, one of the other uh, concerns, um, to me at least in the scholarship, is that much of this scholarship is written from the perspective of whites. Right? How do whites experience Brown? Right? So this is the backlash thesis. Right? It's about how Brown emboldened segregationists, and then how segregationists use the Brown decision to justify racial violence. Right? And so when you write from a perspective of African American studies, at the center of your discourse right, are different subjects and different archives. And so the problem here is methodological in nature. For Rosenberg, he simply quotes people like David Guerra, right? This is reckless scholarship, right? To simply quote someone else without performing the kind of archival research itself. Yes, sir. <clears throat> um, Tim, prior to Brown, there were two or three other decisions, Sweat versus Painter and so forth, that paved the way for Brown, which represented decisions by the Supreme Court um, uh, in favor of civil rights, in favor of desegregated educational facilities. Um, do you have a sense of why it was that those decisions, is there any evidence that those decisions were also um, giving inspiration to civil rights activists? Brown is not the first time that the Supreme Court puts its imprimatur on the cause of the civil rights movement and against segregation. It's certainly the most visible. Uh, have you looked at those earlier decisions? And I guess I'm wondering, is in part the reason that this decision became so important to Dr. King and began to play a role because it was validated in an ironic way by all the backlash against it, that, that the movement was able to call attention to it and, and begin to use it for its own positive purposes because the country was talking about it so much more so than it was talking about uh, the Oklahoma or the Texas law school cases that preceded Brown. Right. Um, let's say in Alabama, right? On the heels of Sweat v. Painter, um, you have many African Americans who are trying to go to places like the uh, University of Alabama. Most notably, right, Arthur and Lucy attempts to go um, to the University of Alabama. That Supreme Court decisions that African Americans are cherry picking from these decisions. Right? They're using this language that has been legitimated by the Supreme Court for their own good, right? for their own goals. And so undoubtedly, you see this in lots of the graduate school cases. Um, and then these activists do use the violence. Right? And this is in some ways Carmen's backlash thesis. They do use the violence that Brown helps to engender right, to dramatize their cause. Right? So it's not an accident that Dr. King um, fails in Albany, right? but then he picks Bull Connor in Birmingham because he knows that in Birmingham, Bull Connor will give a show for television cameras, right? that there will be lots of people being beaten. Right? And then you have Project C in Birmingham, right? again, bringing children to the forefront to dramatize the cause. Right? And so even though in Birmingham, you see Dr. King in the letter from the Birmingham jail, what does he cite to for this idea of rule of law? Brown versus Board of Education. And so Brown is used in lots of different areas. And we can just stay in Alabama and have lots of examples. Sir. Um, thank you for a great talk. And uh, I'm interested in sort of how you spoke about how Dr. King embraced the sort of internationalist rationale of Brown in the context of the Cold War. And it's really interesting to me that it seems to have like sort of two currents to it. One is like this acceptable path of discourse in America in the mid-1950s. And the other is sort of like, you know, it's almost threatening in a way. It's like, hey, this is really what we have to do. And or we're going to lose to the Soviets. I was wondering if you could touch on that. Right. In some ways, this is the double V all over again, right? You might think about it simply democracy at home, right? If you're talking about democracy abroad. The nuance here that, that we have is that the activists, people like Dr. King, are doing this within the context of remaining politically viable, right? So what the Cold War does, it begins to purge people who are too far on the left of the, of the civil rights movement. So again, people like Du Bois, right? Du Bois moves to Ghana because he's so marginalized. 
right? Paul Robeson, William Patterson. And so what Brown does is that at a time in which right, internationalism is potentially threatening, but it's also self-serving to the nation, he uses the, the decision to sort of chart a middle course, right? To, to remain in some ways within Cold War confines, right? And not to be necessarily as, quote, radical as the boys and others, but at the same time to be profoundly committed to racial insurgency. Yes, ma'am. So I'm curious, I know you're focusing here on Dr. King, but if you look at, you know, sort of activists that were less well known and less well read, how much do you see them using Brown and in what ways are they using Brown and with what sort of nuance are they using Brown? Have you looked into that yet? Definitely. Um, lots of people on the ground. So um, in places throughout Alabama, in Selma, Alabama, Roanoke, Alabama, um, you have activists who are just like Dr. King who are using ground. Um, the SCLC, many of the um, organizations, so the SCLC is an organization of organizations. And to take on uh, membership within the SCLC required to sign on to the bylaws of the SCLC. And then the bylaws of the SCLC, right, it's a sort of Cold War civil rights framework, right, but using the Brown decision in a really particular way, in a really particular way. And so throughout the country, right, Rosenberg, his thesis in some ways is, to Professor Bell's point, right, ridiculous, right, that this, you have this decision, right, that is clearly in your favor. Why not use the Supreme Court decision in your favor? It's being reported on the new, in, the, in black newspapers, right? Many people are spreading the word about Brown, right? That you have organizations like the SCLC that are having crusades for, uh, crusades for citizenship, right? That are using the language of Brown. And so yes, this is widespread. It's not simply Dr. King. I simply use Dr. King as the most egregious example. If you don't understand Dr. King, then you can't understand these other local people on the ground. Yes, sir. I wonder if you had other examples of how Brown kind of changed the tactics that activists were using on the ground, like a push to go integrate a school following right after, or kind of other ways in which not just the rhetoric changed, but the actual on the ground tactics as well. Right. So um, it's important, though, to note. So, in the NAACP, the NAACP does become preoccupied with the Brown, with enforcing the Brown decision. So you might think about the NAACP, uh, it's particularly at the national level, as Brown changing their tactics to focus on primarily on school desegregation, but they're doing lots of other issues. They're doing things like economic justice. Now on the ground, many activists, um, like in Montgomery, they want to fight not necessarily for desegregated schools. That's important, but at this time. Bus boycotts are the most important thing. Public transportation. And so in many ways, right, these activists aren't necessarily preoccupied with Brown, but they're willing to use Brown as a tool, right, in many other different in many other fights at the ballot box, and public transportation, etc. Yes, sir. Is there is it valid somewhat to criticize Brown to a certain degree insofar as the fact that it seems reading Brown that the Supreme Court went out of its way to so say that, well, we don't believe in discriminating at the school or segregating schools, but we're not really willing to talk about social applications and desegregation in a broad sense. I kind of got that when I read Brown that it seemed that they were, they were talking about schools, but they weren't willing to go as far as address social settings and other public situations. Right, so social settings are different from other public situations, right? So part of this is simply the state action doctrine that the state action doctrine right, keeps the Supreme Court from going into these other settings. Right? Um, but Brown is about school desegregation just squarely, and so the Supreme Court right, is responding to the legal question that's presented. Right? But in, in 56, they move on and talk about right, public, uh, public transportation, desegregation and public transportation. <laughs> One of the sort of interesting things to think about, though, is why is Brown, to your point about the social sphere, why is Brown in 54 and Loving in 67, right? The Supreme Court is actively in avoiding certain kinds of questions too, right? So that they can construe, right, their response to that particular question. Yes, sir. This may be totally off topic, but since we have a few minutes, um, 
I was wondering if you could talk about how Brown was sort of received in black communities on the ground in the north. Or if it, what type of things were going on there, if you Right, this is also an important question, right? How do people use Brown outside of places that have de jure segregation? Again, you see many people, for, uh, if you read the black newspapers, they're excited about the Brown opinion, right? So the Pittsburgh Courier, the Chicago Defender, right? The New York Amsterdam News, they all publicize, right, that Brown has come down. So in some ways, there's a sympathy for their southern brothers and sisters. Uh, in other ways, many of these activists attempt to use the Brown opinion to challenge Right, racial segregation and other spheres of life. Right, and then we have to think about the border states, right, where there had been some compliance, um, and these activists take the Brown decision to push school desegregation much further in places like Delaware and in Kansas. Just to follow up on that, I mean, to what are I mean, you end up with school desegregation cases in the North, you know, Detroit, elsewhere? To what extent have you looked into that at all in terms of, of the impact? <coughs> in activizing, uh, activating uh, sentiment in northern cities to attempt to prove purposeful discrimination there. Right, the challenge here is purposeful discrimination, right? This de jure de facto distinction. And so in Keys, for example, right, this is 20 years after Brown, but these northern activists and these western activists are still struggling with the question of de facto segregation, right, an issue that continues to dog us today. And so for many of these activists, they have a tough time at getting around the state action doctrine question. So you focused on the years from 54 to 58, and I was wondering if you noticed anything in Dr. King's writings after 58 where he expressed dissatisfaction with the slow nature in which society was implementing Brown, or the courts were implementing Brown, and instead and shifted away from focusing on what the courts could offer, and instead focused on what his social movements and what a social movement could bring about. Right, so Dr. King by 57 is clearly frustrated with the slow compliance of Brown. And this continues throughout the early 1960s and even through the mid-1960s. Um, the, the question uh, becomes, how does Dr. King think about the relationship between courts and communities? Right? Dr. King doesn't simply want to put courts at the center of the discourse. This is what the national NAACP is doing. Right? He has a more fluid approach. This is a social movement approach. He's thinking about people outside of courts as also being important to um, furthering right, constitutional change that non-lawyers, right, on the people on the ground gave Brown a meaning. So the Supreme Court wasn't the final arbiter of what Brown meant for Dr. King. He had seen it right, throughout the South in places like Little Rock. He continued to see it in places like Birmingham and Albany. Right? And so for Dr. King, he's willing to use courts. He thinks that lawyers should be actively involved in the movement, but that lawyers should uh, support rather than supplant direct action. That the two might work together. He often works to diffuse the tension between the SCLC and the NAACP in particular. He's always calling on the NAACP's help. So part of this is also pragmatic in nature, right? That the NAACP has the lawyers, right? And you have lots of people who are getting arrested. And so the NAACP support is, is critically important for what uh, Dr. King is doing on the ground. Tim, in analyzing these texts, does the, does the fact that Brown was about schools, and more particularly K-12 education and children, does that have resonance? Is it, is it that we're glorifying the court and, and, and seeing the sort of, uh, you know, the, the moral authority of the court behind this cause, or is the subject matter of Brown itself the fact it is about, the, you know, the most quintessentially American sort of pathways to success and upward mobility and equality and so forth. How significant is that? I, I have forgotten, I just thought it Shelley versus Kramer is 1948, that, and that was a unanimous decision that evidently no one's imagination was sparked by striking down restrictive real estate covenants. I mean, this is, yeah, how much of this is the fact that it's, it's about schools and kids and education in, in, in the speeches and the references that Dr. King and leaders of the movement are making? To be sure, after Shelley, I'm um, going to an early question, right? You have activists on the ground who are attempting to implement Shelley. But the question about children is important, and that cuts multiple ways, right? So on one hand, um, education is the preparation for life, right? It's a cornerstone of 
American democracy. And so the idea that you would attack education is very important. Right, to, to many of the activists. Um, but Brown, but on the other hand, children are, um, it's difficult to deal with children. Why does the NAACP do graduate cases uh, before K-12 edu uh, education? In some ways, it's pragmatic in nature, right? It costs a lot more to build a new law school, right, as opposed to a new elementary school, right? So you make segregation as expensive as possible. But the other major concern is that you have young kids, right, who will become under the influence of this integration question. And integration, right, for many segregationists, right, brings up the question of miscegenation. Right? Eisenhower famously says that he doesn't, he sympathizes with the Southerners because he doesn't want right, little white schoolgirls sitting next to overgrown Negroes. Right? So this question of miscegenation. So the, the question of children cuts multiple ways. The other thing that's powerful, though, about Brown that's not powerful about, for example, sweat is that the idea that separate is inherently unequal. Right? You don't get that same uh, proclamation in sweat and some of the other cases right, that you see in Brown. Yes, sir. You mentioned the international politics angle of it a little bit. Um, considering that both the Soviet Union used um, racial unrest in America as its own propaganda, and King was followed like, and spied on by the FBI for being a suspected communist. Can you comment on that Cold War aspect of that a little bit? Right, so the Cold War is playing a huge role, right? The Cold War is framing civil rights discourse. Um, how King uses the ideas of democracy abroad and democracy at home. Now, Brown gives this a new sort of twist to the, to the Cold War imperative. But on the other hand, Dr. King is being spied on. Right? People like uh, Bayard Rustin, who becomes one of Dr. King's uh, closest lieutenants, actually had some prior communist ties that he had long severed. Right? But once a communist, under uh, sort of federal logic, you're always a communist. Right? So Dr. King is actively seeking to avoid that. And so if you read the speeches, if you go to the archives, Dr. King is saying that my racial insurgency is not communist inspired. I'm not like right, the Civil Rights Congress. I'm not like the National Negro Congress, organizations that get marginalized. And so, again, the Cold War is constraining discourse in a particular way, but Brown gives him a way to talk about race right, and nation in a, in a very important and novel manner. Just, just briefly, uh, you think you're not really talking about this, but I'm wondering, how does King explain Brown at the moment in, in Supreme Court history. And I'm curious, how do you explain it? And I'm asking, of course, in reference to Rosenberg and your fodder throughout that talk. Right. Um, King explains Brown using the Cold War context. He understands that Brown is a Cold War, uh, Brown is a Cold War case, right? So primarily, he's also right, thinking about the institutional legitimacy of the court. That if the court comes down in a particular way against school desegregation, Right, then this will be uh, fodder um, for the Soviets. Um, the last idea, I guess, about how King thinks about um, Brown is that the federal government is increasingly on civil rights activist side. That that Truman um, is that Truman had been more on um, the side of civil rights uh, civil rights movement. It had sent the Truman administration had sent lots of briefs and the graduate school cases, for example, uh, to the Supreme Court. Uh, but then the Eisenhower administration had also been more sympathetic. And so Dr. King is thinking about a Supreme Court um, that is influenced by these presidential administrations as well. So could I follow just briefly? And this is, mind you, a trick question. Um, how does he explain, and, and you alluded to this, the, the Loving case. Mm -hmm. um, Yuri Brown, surely Loving follows directly from Brown. Yet it takes 13 years. Here we are desegregating golf courses and public buses and everything in sight. Right. But the one big question with marriage it takes 13 years. Right. So I'm wondering, um, you alluded to this earlier, you had a story about, brief, not a story, but a, a sentence about how you explained it. I'm wondering if you have a story to tell about that. Here we are fighting Brown in 54, all these great um, stories that you can tell, yet it takes 13 years for the biggest question of all, 
Right. To be resolved, what, what's the story there? Yeah, um, from Dr. King's perspective, it's not clear. From the NAACP's perspective, it's clear. They don't want to bring that case, right? They don't bring Loving v. Virginia. The ACLU actually brings Loving v. Virginia. Right? They're cognizant of these justices' experiences. Um, and they don't want to bring the wrong case before the Supreme Court. And so they know that the Supreme Court is picking and choosing. So from Dr. King's perspective, it isn't particularly clear from the archival uh, research that I've done. But from the NAACP's perspective, they're very concerned about this miscegenation question. And they understand how these justices are reading right, massive resistance in the South as well. Right? And so they don't have an army to enforce this decision. So the NAACP doesn't bring these cases. That has to be our last question. Thank <laughs> you.